everybody, and welcome. Thank you for joining us at our CPMC uh, virtual town hall. It is nice to be with all of you, and thank you for joining us. Um, today, we are delighted uh, to be able to feature Alternatives to Violence, uh, or AVP, as it often gets referred to. Um, AVP USA is an association of community, school, and prison-based groups offering experiential workshops in personal growth, community development, and creative conflict management. Founded in prison and developed from the real life experiences of prisoners, ABP encourages every person's innate power to positive, positively transform themselves first and then the world we live in. And so I'm excited to hear more about it. What's exciting uh, about ABP is you may very well have an ABP chapter or group in your region and you might not know it. Um, and so we're excited to be able to share about this and then you can kind of look and see if there is a, a local chapter, if you will, that you could actually engage in your own region. So today I am delighted to introduce to you Deacon Denny Davis um, from ABP and he has two special guests with him, Deacon Chet Cordell and Colleen Cordell who are also with us. Um, and the structure for today is we're gonna go ahead and let um, them offer their presentation um, on, on alternatives to violence. Um, if you have questions as we're going along, feel free to put them in the chat, but we're gonna reserve those towards kind of the latter part of the town hall once they've had a chance to present for them to address questions that you might have. Um, so Deacon Denny, Chet, Colleen, welcome. Thanks for being with us and uh, I will turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Joe. Can everybody hear me? You hear me okay? Thumbs up? Okay, good. Welcome, and uh, I, f I first want to uh, really thank the Catholic Prison Ministry Coalition for this opportunity to join you today and talk about our program. Uh, as Joe said, I'm Denny Davis. I live uh, right outside a little town called Burbank, South Dakota. Yes, there is a Burbank, South Dakota, a town of about 50 people. Uh, Chet and Colleen are actually from a little smaller town than, than where I'm at. So uh, the population in this state is about 860,000 in the whole state, which to people in big cities is uh, just a drop in the bucket. But um, we have a large, a very large prison population, over 3,000 at the moment. So we're going to talk about alternative to violence. Uh, I also want to thank uh, Karen Clifton and Joe for uh, helping us do this presentation. Karen, I've known for many years, a uh, big, big hearted woman, a beautiful woman. And uh, I'm so grateful that I can be here. That's a great picture, Joe. So I wanna start just with kind of an overview of what Alternative to Violence Project is. Uh, I'm gonna be reading from uh, Eve Fisher's analysis. Eve is one of our uh, primary facilitators along with Mary Montoya and Eve's uh, husband, Alan. So we're kind of, even Alan and Mary and Chet and Colleen are kind of the grandfather, grandmother folks of this program here in South Dakota. So Alternative to Violence Project was founded by prisoners in the New York prison system in collaboration with Quakers in 1975. Now uh, it has local chapters in 40 states and 20 countries. It is entirely volunteer. There's no paid staff, uh, facilitators, or participants. Also, nobody is required in the prison system to take AVP. It's entirely voluntary. Here in South Dakota, our prison workshops run 20 to 24 hours in length over a three-day period. It is entirely experiential, which is a fancy way of saying we don't lecture. We do exercises and role plays so that the workshop participants can work things out for themselves. What we learn by doing generally sticks with us longer rather than just lectures. We have basic, advanced, and training workshops for facilitators, and we have both inmate and outside facilitators. ABP 
is a spiritual program, but we never talk about God and we never talk about religion. It is completely non-denominational. Its underlying premise is transforming power. That there is a spiritual power within each one of us, including both you and my adversary, that is able to transform violent behavior into nonviolent, cooperating behavior. But to get to it, to use it, we have to peel away our anger, our fear, our guilt, our shame, our greed, our envy, and our pride, so that we can see what is really going on inside of us. And then practice honoring and respecting all of humanity as well, of our, as, as well as ourselves and all the people that we encounter. To learn to see people as humans is to be engaged rather than objects to be manipulated. That is what we really call peacemaking. The core components to transforming power. Can you put that Mandela up, Joe, please? Yep, I'm working on it. One second. It's all right. The core components are self uh, respect for self, caring for others. We expect the best. We think before acting, and we ask for a nonviolent solution. So, brothers and sisters, we hear a lot about justice in our country. We're probably one, of, arguably, one of the most violent countries in the world. A word that we almost never hear and that Pope Francis has done so well to bring forward in our day is the word mercy. This is what alternative to violence is about, mercy. So basically, rather than retributive justice, which is about the law and punishment, we work with restorative justice. Restorative justice basically looks at the harm that was done, both to the uh, victim but also to the perpetrator and to the community at large. I think about the violence that was done on 9-11 and how all of us watched our TV sets time and time again as the uh, planes hit those towers. Uh, that, that's putting ourselves in a traumatic situation and in a violent situation. And many people grow up with that kind of violence. In AVP, we begin to realize that hurt people hurt people. We live in a very violent society. So how can we begin at least to recognize the violence within ourselves and then transform that by learning the tools necessary for a nonviolent life? If we do not transform, transform our pain, we most assuredly will transmit it. What do we do then? What has already happened within our lives? And for the inmates, as many of you know, a lot of trauma has happened in their lives. How do we keep from the need to blame, to punish, or to accuse? This is the task before us in the AVP program. None of us who lead this program in our local prison, we have uh, basically three in South Dakota, two in Sioux Falls, the older prison and the maximum security prison, and one in Springfield, South Dakota, and then the women's prison, excuse me, four prisons. The women's prison is in Pierre, which is our capital. None of us who do this program, who volunteer to facilitate this program are professionals and count counseling or, or psychology, but we all are wounded people. And through those wounds, we can facilitate the healing of others. And so my question has always been, why as a society would we want to punish when we have the opportunity to heal our fellow human beings? There's a saying that goes, people with broken hearts give birth to whole hearts. All we do in this program as facilitators is we provide a safe space for others to heal. So hopefully that'll kind of give you an overview of what we're about 
in the alternative to violence program. Uh, Colleen and Chet are going to kind of get into several of the, it's impossible for us to share the whole program in the short time we have together. But I think after Colleen and Chet share some of the specifics of what we do in this program, you'll have a better idea of what this transforming power is all about. So thanks, and I'll turn it over to Colleen. Go for it, woman. You got to unmute yourself. There we go. There you go. Okay, greetings, everyone. Uh, thank you for letting us present to you today. And um, my name is uh, Colleen, and I'm a member of the Sistan Mopton tribe. Uh, northeastern South Dakota here and there's probably like 7,000 members and um, I really enjoy working uh, with people that have been incarcerated and so uh, I've been doing this since 1977. Um, my first job I took, my first um, boss was really involved with the prisoners and so of course then I got involved and have been doing it in different different um, areas and workshops since you know with the REC and then now with AVP and um, I'm going to talk a little bit on one of the workshops we do is what is violence and nonviolence, and I had just done this with uh, one of the, the girls or the, the women at the women's prison. Uh, her name is Amanda and we, we did this. And this is a workshop to explore alternatives to violence, to find ways to live and to solve problems non-violently in a society that is very violent. And the first step in solving a problem is to be clear what the problem is. So um, we need to have an idea what this group means by violence. So we asked the girls, you know, um, what violence means to them. And a uh, way to do this uh, is uh, we usually, Amanda and I chose to, do, to use like a tree and you have um, the, what are the fruits of violence and what are the fruits of nonviolence and uh, I don't know if you guys can see this, but this is kind of, you know, and then, you, then I wrote down, wrote down, you know, some of the things that they, they throw out words and stuff and, and, you know, what violence is to them and then, and then what nonviolence is. And then, then on the bottom are some of the roots of that violence. Um, and then, you know, the, the women, you know, some of the words they use are, are different than the men's. Uh, you know, women, it's um, the violence is hunger, um, neglect, uh, cheating and lies and um, fear. And then the nonviolence, you know, respect, love, listening, um, practice, mindfulness, healthy relationships, working for justice. And then um, and then on the violence, I added, because last year, you know, I seen a lot of this and being home, uh, I added to the violence, the, you know, and, and Denny kind of touched on this, the, the cyber bullying and stuff with, you know, since we're all, everything's, everybody has their phone and, and everything, we're watching everything connected to that now and seeing everything. And then some of the, you know, the roots of the violence, uh, I put you know, then you have to connect some of the roots, you know, I have racism and betrayal and greed, drugs, alcohol, frustration. And um, those are some of the, the roots that the girls had. And the one of them was, you know, and then you have to connect the violence to the, to the roots. How do they connect? And, you know, and I put cyber bullying in the violence and then in the um, roots of violence, I put the exposure to violent media. You know, they keep showing the same thing over and over or else they, you know, um, they get on one person and then they just keep, I don't know, putting them down or whatever, you know, it's hardly building them up. 
you know, sometimes I think I see more of them um, putting them down than trying to build them up and say, you know, what can we do to make this a better society and help each other? And so that's why I just added that to this. And then <laughs> working, you know, oh, and then I was going to give you some, I was trying to think with the guys because we started working with uh, AVP in 2009 and we finally got to go into the women's prison in the fall of 2019, which is there's a 10 years difference. So we worked, had 10 years working with the guys and I was trying to think of, cause I did this with, it, it, with the guys too. And, you know, just like I said, some of their violence, what they described, you know, with the guys, it was things like guns, fighting and gangs, um, you know, where the women, it was more like, cheating and lies and hunger, you know, it, it was different to see, see those differences and, and be able to work with them and trying to help them to work through some of those issues and, and um, just to, rem to respect yourself and start with yourself and then um, just meeting back up with the girls again and some of them, their kids, are you know teenagers now and how when they call home you know and oh she's 12 she's got this attitude but I can't you know I just try and use some of my AVP skills that I'm learning that you guys have taught me you know and how to just reach over and hit the stop button and say okay this is this you know don't take it personal you know this is something she's going through and you know and and especially the mothers, they haven't been able to interact with their children or anything. You know, they haven't been able to have their children come in and, you know, meet that way. It's all has to be like we're doing today, Zoom wise. So uh, it, it's, you know, so they've been, this last year has really been hard on them, you know, and, and it was good to hear and see some of them that are using some of the AVP skills that we taught them and some of the guys too, you know, it all, I think I keep telling myself, you know, you don't see big processes and stuff and you might not right away, you know, but at least we're planting the seeds. So, and then some of the, some of the guys, I see the biggest promise problem with them and why they get in trouble is they don't have any father figures, you know, um, it's really hard sometimes to, to visit with somebody who doesn't have a father figure, you know, um, it was, I guess, something I took for granted. <laughs> so, uh, with that, I'll probably pass it on to Chet for his, his part. Hello, everybody. This is Chet. Can you hear me? Okay. Um, Joe, by chance, do you have that third uh, slide, that third image of the, tools. the, the uh, like the mission statement of the program? I don't know if Denny got that to you or not. I believe I have it. Let me bring it up here. If you can, I would like to, I'm going to actually read that, but then everybody can kind of follow along. In the meantime, again, my name is Chet and the one before me is my significant other and life would really suck without her. <laughs> I'm very appreciative of Colleen. Uh, we've been together for uh, many, many years. I think 38, 39, 39 years we've been married. We have four kids. Um, I was ordained to the diaconate about uh, in 2012. Um, Let's see. I got to get my notes in front of me here. Okay. Um, is that image up, Chad? Yes. Yes, it is. Thank you Great. so much, Joe. Uh, so uh, when I first began, uh, I was introduced to AVP by a, a lady by the name of, of Mary. And uh, I thought she said ATV, you know, all-terrain vehicle. And she goes, no, 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 no. It's not an ATV. It's an ABP, B for violence. So I kind of chuckled on that one. Uh, uh, there's something that we can begin with too, is 
in the prison system, we found that there's a lot of dehumanizing kind of. So what do you, what, what way to dehumanize someone is to take away their name. So most, at least in South Dakota, everybody goes by their last name. You know, it's if whatever your last name, mine would be, hey, Cordell, you know, but in AVP, we take our first names or our nickname and we attach a positive adjective name in front of that. So every time we address the group, we begin by saying who we are. So instead of Chet, I'm chatty Chet, just because I'm very windy and talk a lot. And then this one here is calm Colleen and uh, we also have delightful Denny so Denny raise your hand there you know <laughs> so <laughs> uh, so we do that with all the guys and uh, and the gals and it, it's amazing how that automatically starts breaking the ice for people who really aren't familiar with all of this okay I've spent a decade of my life uh, over a decade now working within this program and I have done most of it at the maximum security facility in Sioux Falls called Jameson. And it's a, it's a, it's a marvelous program. At, at the end of every workshop, uh, people get a completion certificate. And what you're looking at on your screen is the uh, on the back of that certificate is kind of our mission statement. And maybe you could read along with me. Workshops in nonviolent conflict resolution sponsored by the South Dakota Alternatives to Violence Project. The Alternatives to Violence Project is an organization of dedicated volunteers committed to helping people develop effective ways of dealing with conflicts creatively and without violence. Its courses are offered only to voluntary participants. Each course consists of a 22 hour intensive program of exercises and discussions designed to develop self-esteem and self-confidence in a trusting and supporting atmosphere, which in turn creates a sense of community. The courses teach principles of cooperation, respect, an affirmation of the dignity of every living being. Listening, communication, and observational skills are enhanced, empowering individuals to explore a variety of nonviolent solutions that are possible in almost every conflict situation. So with all of those compound sentences, <laughs> uh, that's in a nutshell kind of what AVP does and what it's all about. Um, I could talk for hours on this. It's, it's, it's part of our lives now. Uh, so it's kind of difficult to dummy it down, so to speak, into just a few minutes. So now I'll talk about the program itself. Thank you, Joe, appreciate that. The, um, we, you start off with AVP, there's three levels to the program. There's a basic workshop weekend, that's that 22 hour program. And then the, you learn all the principles of AVP or at least you're exposed to them and uh, the different tools that you can use to affect change in your life. The next workshop is called an advanced workshop and that's where you you, you build on the, on the first workshop, you use all the same principles, you use all the same tools, but you dig into it a little bit deeper. Um, for example, we're going to have a advanced workshop at the women's prison here uh, just in a couple of weeks. And the theme that they have chosen is anger and relationships. So we'll take those two, uh, facts of living, right? Anger and relationships. And we'll try to incorporate AVP and all of its principles and tools into that. The third layer or level is called a T4F. That means training for facilitators. And that's where we will actually train um, people to be facilitators. Why you do things the way they do, uh, getting used to presenting in front of a 
uh, group, uh, all the dynamics that, that that involves. Then there's one more uh, part of the program and that's called what we call a refresher. It's very similar to um, an AA meeting in a way. It's, it's once a month, usually at about that time frame. Everybody who has been in the program uh, can get together and just kind of go through what's going on in their life. We, we always meet in a big circle. You know, there's not a beginning, there's not an end, you know, and we're all a link in that circle. Um, and just see how it's going. Like, uh, you know, what, what was hard for me the last few weeks? Uh, I had this uh, blow up with one of the officers and, and I wish I would have remembered to do this or, or whatever. And then at the same time, the group can be responding back to you if you have questions or problems. So it's kind of an aftercare program, which really helps the, the, the sense of community. Another quick aspect about the programs is, and that very first basic workshop, it's important to develop a sense of trust because prison is not a place that there's a lot of trust, okay? So you have to try to get people at ease that they're there and that what they're gonna say has importance. No one's gonna make fun of them and the confidentiality of the weekend is so important. And we stress that real heavy on the, the, the first couple, three hours. So in my heart, if we usually start about noon on Friday and we'll end about five o'clock uh, the first day and then start again early Saturday morning. If we don't have a sense of trust and community already beginning to build by 10 o'clock Saturday morning, the weekend will not go very well. And I have to have had maybe 50, 60 workshops under my belt now, and it always happens. If you follow the principles of this program, you will develop a sense of trust and community. It's, it's amazing how it works. Okay, I'm gonna move on a little bit. Um, okay. Okay, Joe, could you put up the tools uh, picture, please? for the AVP tools. You already saw the Mandela, that all those circles uh, and how they will, it's not like a bullseye, right? But yeah, it doesn't mean much unless you've got a tool to use. So um, maybe Joe, you can kind of blink back and forth between the, the, that Mandela and these tools a few seconds each way. You know, on that Mandela, uh, you know, you're asking for a nonviolent solution or you're asking for respect for self or caring for others, you know. And then some of the tools that, that you use for that is to de-escalate a situation or to check your feelings or anger scale. In a couple of minutes, I'm going to talk a little bit about the anger scale, uh, how you can be an adult, grow up a little bit you know, how to have empathy for others. You know, it's, it's amazing on how, depending on, the, on the, the person who attends, how they were brought up, what, what positive things they've had in their life and, and the not so positive things. And it's amazing how people lack tools to, to, promote peace. They just, the only thing that they know how to do is either out shout someone or to pick up your dukes and, and fight it out. Well, this is a program saying that there's others ways, other ways to do that. Um, it, it, the program causes those who are participate to rethink your actions when it comes to a conflict situation. And, and as Colleen was saying, these conflict situations, they're all over the place all the time. We're constantly getting bombarded, television and emails and telephone calls and just our relationship, even in the grocery store, you know, you've been in line where somebody will say, gee, hurry up, or why don't they have another checker? But I mean, it's, it's not a friendly type positive experience. So that's what we're coming into the program, all of us, whether you're on the inside or the outside. And, and for those who have only experienced that violent end of things, the gang end of things, you know, they're, they're, 
it's it's kind of a, a turning the light on and you can see that happening in the weekend they're, they're going oh i never thought about that before i, I didn't know you could just walk away <laughs> you know yeah and, and you can that is an option you know so for for this to work first of all You've got to realize that that there's violence around you and that you are a violent person. And I think we all have violent tendencies one way or another. And then you got to acknowledge within yourself that, well, now is the time to come for change in my life. And then you have to, probably the most important is to choose to use this Mandela, all of the, the, the tools to uh, make a change, not only in myself first, but for, in my own life, but for those around us. So how do you do that? You know, you got to develop a team. There's an outside team. Jenny is on the outside team. I'm on the outside team. Uh, Tom Colleen is on the outside team. But you also have to have an inside team. And without that inside team, you know, you, you it's, the, the inmates will accept what's being said to them by a fellow inmate, I think, easier in many cases than for somebody from the outside because we're not living it every day, the situations that these guys and women are in. Whereas the inside team does. They live in right along with them, right around with the whole group of people. So to develop an inside team, you have to really spend some time with these people. And I have, and I've gotten to know the, the guys for 10 years. And now some of the, the, the leadership that's developing in, in the women's prison with the ladies. And you, you know, you know, they're, they're good points, you know, their weak points, you know, the, the tragedy in their life, the, their goals, their happiness. And the more you can, can do that with these people, the better you're going to be able to, as a team, as a group, present all of these principles at, at workshops. So I'm going to talk a, about just a, a few of the people in my lives, my life so far. And the first one is going to be a guy by the name of Dynamic Dave. Dynamic Dave. Now get this for those of you who are on the inside. He was in solitary confinement for over 20 years. I mean, wow. It's amazing that uh, he isn't completely a babbling idiot because to be in solitary confinement for that long is just inhuman, unreal. Anyway, about six, seven years ago, they began to modify those uh, about how much time you can be in, in, in uh, solitary confinement. And so Dave got out. And during those years, he, he did a lot of soul searching. And man, he came out and he was a changed person just from his reflective time inside uh, those uh, solitary confinement walls. And he came out saying, I got to do my best to help everybody else around here get through this. And he did. He became a, a, a member of the AVP team. Um, he, he was an excellent facilitator. Uh, he was in touch with his emotions and wasn't uh, afraid to share them, fear and hope and sadness and joy. And because of, of his, his uh, crimes at the, at the facility in Sioux Falls, you know, he asked for, recently asked for a, um, oh, I can't think of the name of it. Anyway, he's, he, he's moved now up into the North Dakota prison system. And I'm going to really miss Dave because Dave is, is a wonderful man. Uh, we got very close. Another guy is Sly Sam. And he's a, he's a small statured young man. Uh, his crime put him in just at around his 18th birthday. And he was sentenced for life. And it took him a while to figure out, um, you know, how, how am I going to do all this? And so there was a time where he just stayed off by himself. But anyway, we coax uh, Sly Sam into joining AVP. 
and what a blessing he's been. And over the years, like he and I developed a grief workshop. Imagine 22 hours helping people to understand what grief is all about and how do you grieve while you're li living in prison. If you lost a family member, you can't go to the, to the, the uh, grave site. You know, how do you get through that? And grief isn't just death, it's, you know, loss of freedom, maybe loss of a child if the courts took away your parental uh, guardianship, uh, uh, loss of, of the type of job you used to do on the outside. So, I mean, there was just all kinds of different types of loss. And so we, we developed that, uh, that whole workshop. And that was really, talk about getting close to somebody in a process of putting together 22 hours worth of exercises, huh? He also, and, and him and I both saw the need for the, for the A&O guys um, coming into the uh, system, they would get gobbled up by the gangs right away. So we began an AVP basic workshop just for the A&O, that means admitting and orientation uh, part of their entrance into prison. So we would have a workshop just for them and to see that they don't have to do the gangs and that they can uh, live nonviolently, even in prison. Uh, Sam and I did that together. There was another man in the very early ages called Determined Dan. And he was a very charismatic guy. And again, Denny talked about us not, you know, talking about religion, so to speak, or, or about God, because everybody is welcome here. It doesn't matter what color you are or what, what uh, faith or, or your belief system is. But he said, if you took it, and Joe, if you could go back to that big Mandela uh, photo, if you, could, if you could take that symbol that says transforming power right there in the center of that circle and peel that back, underneath that is hope. That's what this is all about. And, you know, we all know, and it's kind of, it's not said so much publicly, but Jesus Christ is the hope of the world, you know. So this is a very spiritual program. Uh, could somebody tell me how much time I have left? Roughly. Uh, we've got... Um, if you maybe want to present for maybe about five more minutes and then we can have time for questions and for if anybody has some discussion. Very good. I'll, I'll do that quick. I'm going to finish this by, uh, there's a, one of the exercises is called the anger scale. And that's just, uh, you know how your, your grandma or your mom or your dad taught you to count to 10, you know, <laughs> you know count to 10 so you don't blow up. Well, there's a whole exercise about this and, and it's called the anger scale and it goes from one to 10. And, you know, when you get up in the morning, take your temperature. What's your temperature? Is your temperature a one or do you wake up and you're already a four, you know? Then you start realizing as you start analyzing this whole concept of, of taking your anger temperature is, my gosh, when I get to a seven or an eight, it's really easy for me to explode. Doesn't take much to set me off and you turn into this huge volcano. That's a, probably a pretty good image to, to think of what anger is. It comes to the point where you explode. So during the course of the day, you start... Um, taking your temperature, you know, like say, oh, once you look at it and you just, okay, uh, if you were in prison, you just had a confrontation with one of the female uh, officers and man, it would be the next person you see, you know, you're already upset and that you don't like the way that they looked at you or they walked by you. You know, if you're not taking your temperature, you could already be at a five or a six after you pass them and you don't even realize it's going on. And so it wouldn't take too many words to get something going with that person you just passed. And the big thing is to keep that volcano from erupting. And the only way to do that is you, by taking this temperature periodically, you can calm yourself down. So here's a little story about this. Now, I have a grandson that is 18 now living with us. Uh, 
that that's that's another story all, all in itself. I didn't realize at 66 I would be dealing with teenagers anymore. <laughs> but anyway, so he got caught um, vaping at school the second time. Okay, so I'm just going to throw that in the background. So I have another little grandson, and he's probably 10, and he lives not too far from here, but he doesn't have school on Fridays the way they have their school system set up. So he usually comes and helps grandpa on Fridays. Well, he he's an adopted child. Um, he has anger issues that are just really, I can, after working in the prison system for so long, I can see if he doesn't get a handle on this, where he might end up. And that's not a place for him. And he's so much better than that. So I was trying to teach him about this, this checking your temperature, right? So we spent all, all one Friday, just, just what's your temperature right now? Because when he would get mad, he would throw things and curse and just kind of lose it, you know? And so we worked on that real hard. And when he, when we, when he went home, I said, now you, you keep checking your, your temperature and stuff. So he made it through school the next Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and then kind of fell off the wagon again on Thursday. So then he was back the next Friday here, you know, and uh, we talked about it again and how, you know, you have to just constantly keep working at it and, you know, don't beat yourself up, but just, just keep trying to do better. Well, then this, I'll go back to the, to the older grandson. Here comes this notification from school <laughs> that, that, uh, that the older boy has to go into in-school suspension. And he had five days of that. So when he got home from school, okay, so we, we, you know, I didn't look at it as a confrontation, but we were talking about this because he, he, he had to do some special stuff. And especially with it, it was the second time. It was just within a week or two. And <laughs> yeah, you know, the, okay, so the smaller grandson's name is Keenan, and he said to, to grandma, she says, oh, grandpa's got to watch his anger temperature. It's really getting up there if he blows up. Now, so, <laughs> you know, so here's this 10-year-old child that understood what I tried to teach him about taking your temperature. He saw it happening right in front of your eyes, his eyes. So... This is what this program can do. It's, it, it happens. I've seen it happen with the men. I'm seeing it happen with the women. And, and what the plus for me with the women is that women are the teachers in our society. They, they really, they, they affect the young or young people in such a great way. If we can keep nonviolence, restricted in their lives and they can pass that on to either their own kids or the kids around them. Just think how we're going to change society. It's working with the guys. It's going to work even better, or I, I, maybe that's the wrong word. It's going to work as well with the women and have a greater influence in our society. And so that's, we've spent the last year or so, we had to take it off, some off for COVID, but teaching these same things at, at the women's facility and we're seeing similar results. So let's see. Uh, I think I should shut up now. <laughs> so, Daddy, thank, you. Daddy, Daddy, <laughs> done. <laughs> thank you so much for sharing that. It's an incredible program and incredible structure and um, it's exciting to hear about it and the fruits of it. Um, what I'd love to do is to kind of open this up to some discussion where people could toss in some questions or comments um, but there was one question that came in over the chat that I will float to you to get us started. And that first question is, um, can you talk a little bit about the support you've received from your Department of Corrections? Um, how did you convince DOC to allow you to be in the facility in the first place to be able to offer these retreats and programming? Some of our members are, are coming up against some pushback from their local DOC about hosting retreats and at access and things like that. So what have you encountered in that regard and how have you been able to work with DOC to allow this to flourish? Denny, you want to take that, I think? Okay. Start, um, anyway. 
Yeah, you guys were earlier than I was, but the um, ABP in the South Dakota system kind of was in and out at the beginning. It kind of had a start and then it kind of fizzled out and then started again. And uh, Colleen and Chet and Mary Montoya especially knows more about that history. But basically now uh, the DOC in South Dakota, because they have seen the results, are very supportive. And as a matter of fact, when we talk to officers or the people in charge at the prison, uh, they give us very, very good feedback in terms of how much they see a change in the guys, because they see that every day in that behavior from the men. And as a matter of fact, a week from today, the head of the uh, South Dakota Parole Board has asked uh, I and Eve and Mary to give them a presentation to the Parole Board because they're hearing so much about AVP. Uh, when guys go up for parole, they want to know more about it. It's like, what are you doing in AVP that is influencing these guys? And we see the influence. So when it, when it gets to the point of a parole board, you know that you're having a positive effect. And uh, I've got just a few statistics here, if you would like to hear. And by the way, anybody that wants to, and maybe Jared can do this, Joe, Google uh, avp.org or alternative to violence.org. I'm not sure what it is. And people then can go ahead and look into that website and see more what the program is about and where you have a local chapter. Uh, as I said, there are a lot of chapters throughout the United States, and I'm sure there's one in some prison that is close to everyone that's on this Zoom. Uh, in the South Dakota Penitentiary System, 155 people have taken ABP on the hill. The hill is the older prison in Sioux Falls that was built in the 1800s. It still has the old steel bars, and that's a pro approximately 25% of that population. 44 men on B and D floor in Jameson, which is also in Sioux Falls, that's our maximum security prison, have taken AVP. That's approximately 20% of the population. So thanks to people like Colleen and Chet and Mary and Eve, who over the years have, you know, really stuck with this program and been very faithful to it, there has been a real effect. And I have to be honest, and I think Chet said this well, the real effect comes from the inside team. The more that inside team becomes a community, you know, where they respect one another, the other guys see that. You know, and it's like in Acts of the Apostles in the early Christian church, see how they love one another. See how they care for one another. That's the key. Yes, we are important. As a matter of fact, they couldn't have the weekends without us. They can't meet together in our system without a facilitator, a pink tag, which is what all of us are. And that, that only says that we're a volunteer that can get into the prison anytime we want. So that's the key, to really build that community. Because when the guys come back to the refreshers, which are once a month, they talk about that. What do I do in this case? I had a confrontation with this guy. And we always tell them, go back to your brothers. Talk to your brothers. Get that anger scaled down because you know what the consequences are gonna be, you know, if you strike this guy, if both of you get in a fight, whatever the consequences are, they go to the hole, they go to solitary. And so they all know that. And so we're trying to give them those tools whereby they can, you know, uh, get this anger scaled down and then have a nonviolent alternative. And that's really the key to the program. I hope that answers the question. Chet, did you have anything, or or, uh, or Corley? Corley? Uh, yes, um, just in in to go along with uh, how administrations start looking at things. You know, it, it's usually from the bottom up. You know, it it's so you'll the staff realizes what's happening uh, during the weekends, and and about ten years or so ago, we had a workshop at Jameson. And the gang violence is a huge problem at the prison there, at the maximum security place. And we managed to get, it was either three or four gang leaders, different gang leaders in the same room. And we were able to do 
an entire workshop without a fight breaking out. And, and that the staff was just amazed that we were able to do that. Now, did that take away all the gang violence? No, you know, but it was, it was a learning experience that you can communicate and you don't have to necessarily duke it out. It's, if, if somebody is really interested in trying to promote AVP in an institution, there are, as Denny was saying, there is so much facts on this that in the research that's been done that this does, this program does curb violence. Thanks, I'll pass. There was, thank you. There was another question that came in over chat. Um, thanks, Patricia. She said, you spoke about the transforming power uh, of the of the mandala, do you use the ten transforming power guidelines? Yes, very definitely. That's a that's a huge part of our weekend. As a matter of fact, we don't even present the mandala until late Saturday afternoon. So we go through those transforming rules, uh, the rules for a nonviolent life. Uh, way we introduce that way before we get into the mandala. So yes, very definitely, uh, that is part of, uh, it's integral to the mandala. And the mandala is integral to, you know, the, the, uh, the rules. And so, yes, very definitely, that's a very important part. Uh, that's the problem with such a short presentation here. We're not able to give you all the, you know, different levels that we grow on, and you do grow as the weekend goes, into what finally we can talk about, okay, this is, this is the mandala. This is how the violent life is transformed into nonviolence because violence is very powerful. But what we try to get across to the guys through all of the program, through all of the weekend, that nonviolence is much, much more powerful. And violence blows us apart. Nonviolence brings us together as a loving community. That's the huge difference. And when you can have a nonviolent life, it spreads. It's like love, it grows throughout the whole community. I've often told the guys in the prison, you can transform this system in this prison. This is where you are. Many of them are lifers. This is where you can do the transformation because of what has happened within you. And they're, they're just like shocked, like, no, yes, you can because this is the power that you have in your hearts now. So I hope that's helpful. Chet, that's great. Colleen? And then Mary T was curious about where and how can we find a location for training in this particular model of transforming violence? Go ahead, Chet. You know, that that's, that, that's a little bit more difficult, especially if you're, you know, I'm, I'm involved in South Dakota and we've, we had a really good uh, set of earlier facilitators that just were dedicated into teaching all of this. And I lucked out and, and got into that group. I, I went to a uh, Catholic chaplain's ministry meeting in the Archdiocese of Milwaukee about four years ago. And there was a whole bunch of uh, chaplains from across the country there. There was hundreds actually. And th at that meeting, there was only one other group way on the other side of the convention hall that had ever heard or was participated in AVP. So the best thing I would think would be to get on that website and to find out where the closest might be and and then get into contact with that closest set of teams. That would be my advice. Pass. Yeah, and that the important thing to remember is that uh, you have to go through the training with a team that's already involved in the prison. And so in other words, to be a facilitator, you have to go through all the basic weekend and the, um, the next weekend and then become a facilitator. So check out if there's a group in your area, and I'm sure there will be if you have a prison around there, where uh, you can get that kind of training if you so desire. That's fantastic. 
Well, we have a, a couple minutes left, and I do have a, a, a couple commercials for you at the end for some <laughs> upcoming opportunities. Um, but feel free, uh, you know, if you want to unmute yourself, if you have a comment or another question or something to add, please feel free to jump right in. Well, I would just simply say in closing, first of all, thank you, Chad and Colleen. God bless you. Talk about two people that have huge hearts. <laughs> if you meet these two people, it's like, wow, they're just incredible, incredible people and all the people on the team. You know, I would just say to, to finish, uh, you, you can't have the mustard plant without the seed. It's not going to happen. And so we are seed planters. That's all we do. We just make ourselves available and hopefully, and we pray all the time that God's spirit will work through our hearts into people's hearts that are horribly, horribly traumatized and wounded people. That's why they're in the system that they're in. And they are not getting justice. And the reason that we concentrate on the perpetrators is because so much attention is uh, allowed for the crime and for the victims, and it should be. I'm not saying that it shouldn't be, but you almost hear nothing about the perpetrators. The law never recognizes what happened to the people that commit the crimes. And so those are the seeds that we wanna plant for uh, healing. Why can't we become a society that heals? Why do we have to be a society that only punishes? And as an ordained minister in the Catholic Church, what does the church have to do with that? How do they promote punishment rather than healing? Whatever happened to the healing that Jesus gave us in the gospel? And so that's just thank you so much for all of you that you took the time to listen today. This is a great program. It is a healing program. And God bless all of you. And thank you, Joe. Thank you so much. Thank you all for, um, for sharing. Um, uh, Patricia, did you have something to jump in before we? Yeah, briefly, thank you. I have uh, facilitated ABP for years at the, um, both the Federal Correctional Institution in Pennsylvania and the State Correctional Institutions. And I, I am, I'm just so grateful for this program and all the good that it does. I'm grateful also for Catholic Prison Ministry Coalition for having these speakers and promoting this topic. I, I completely fully endorse AVP and encourage all the listeners to promote this program, uh, de develop the program, and to become facilitators, train the inmates to be co-facilitators, and then to take the basic, the advanced training and the training for trainers program. Uh, I'm completely in, in endorsing AVP and I, and I wanna thank you all for presenting it. Thank you so much. Thank and thank you all. Um, real quick, but just as we um, wrap up, I just wanna bring your attention to a couple of things. I'm bringing you now, of course, to our CPMC website. Um, you may not know, but this week is Correctional Officers and Employees Week nat nationally. Um, and so we're um, promoting this a little bit um, just to remind all of us that are in this ministry um, that the correctional officers need our care and our ministry and our presence just as much as the residents of facilities that we are serving. Um, so um, we just want to offer that up to just reach out and give some love to the correctional officers that you work alongside in your various ministries. Um, and then also, um, Craig, I wanna give a big shout out to Order of Malta. Um, as you may know, Order of Malta has a national pen pal program that is really amazing that connects the Catholic faithful to residents on the inside and being able to do some pen pal relationships. And I got an email from one of the Order of Malta groups out of Minnesota, and they have this fantastic problem, whereas they have this huge influx of people on the outside that want to be connected to someone on the inside, and they don't have enough people on the inside to be connected. And so they are, and I was like, what a great problem. Usually it's the opposite. <laughs> 
So they really want to promote, and again, it can be anyone from anywhere that gets connected. Um, so they wanted me to put the shout out to, you know, all of the chaplains and ministers that if you have folks on the inside that would like to participate, if you go to our website under Seeking to Minister, drop down here to the Pen Pal program, and the Order of Malta programs will come up right here, and that will get you what you need to get connected. But please feel free to put out the APB to your folks um, that, that, we, that we have Pen Pals available. So it's great news. The other thing, just to highlight some upcoming events, um, May 12th is our next uh, webinar. It will be on women in reentry, featuring um, Sister Maureen O'Connell, who is the founder of Angela House, and Sarah Mabry, who is a case manager from there. Um, so they will be presenting our May 12th uh, webinar, and the times are on there. And then um, for our reentry town hall coming up this month, we are featuring um, sticking with our theme of um, working with incarcerated women, we're going to feature a program called A New Way of Life, founded by uh, Susan Burton um, and supported by St. Vincent de Paul. They are based out of Los Angeles, um, and they have a beautiful reentry program for uh, returning women. Um, so please join us for those two things. Um, we would love to have you. And again, to Deacon Denny, to Chet and Colleen, uh, our deepest gratitude uh, for presenting today and for the amazing and beautiful and healing work that you are doing in our prisons. I don't know who to attribute this saying to, but someone once said, violence is the lowest form of communication. So thank you for teaching our beloved brothers and sisters different ways of communicating. So God bless to all of you. you. I look forward to seeing you, you again and have a great rest of your day. God bless.